For our latest Hoover History Working Group meeting, uh, we were really excited to, to welcome James Rogers, uh, who's Assistant Professor in War Studies uh, in Copenhagen, and uh, a leading military historian uh, with a special interest in, in the changing role of technology in warfare. The title of the talk uh, was The Dark Side of Our Drone Future, and I'm delighted to welcome James uh, to Hoover virtually uh, via Zoom. Uh, James, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for a terrific paper and a fascinating talk. Let me, um, let me just ask you a, a, a really obvious question. Most people, when they hear the term drone warfare, think it's science fiction, it's, it's something extremely new that has barely happened, and yet you're arguing that it has a history. Tell us what that history is. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me on, Neil. And um, yeah, second, in answer to your question, well, the history of drone warfare is, I mean, over 100 years old now. The original allure of the drone arose out of the horror and brutality of the First World War. So we're talking over 364,000 American casualties, you know, protests in the streets in the United States about the fact that America, which was never meant to be drawn into this prolonged and protracted brutal war of the European old world on European soil, was of course drawn into it. And you had America's best and brightest and, and youngest maimed, injured and killed in that conflict. But out of this comes this genesis of an idea from early American air power thinkers like uh, Colonel Edgar S. Burrell and Brigadier General Billy Mitchell, who thought, right, there's a way in which we can respond to this public sentiment and growing political pressure never to repeat that slaughter of the previous war by investing in new air power technologies and new air power strategies. And they developed a thing called industrial web theory, a new strategy, which was colloquially called precision bombing doctrine. And what they did was they wanted to fly up over the battlefield, not through the enemy, but over the enemy, and to bomb their vital war making capacity with pinpoint precision. Um, and that would mean that they could take out the munitions factories, they could take out the places where there was um, you know, rubber produced, the oil refineries, and you could deny the enemy a powerful teeth to meet you on the battlefield. And then when you did finally meet them, you could drive through them quite quickly. One of the earliest technologies that they invented to try and help them achieve this was the first drone called the Kettering Bug, invented by a man called Charles Kettering, who well, he invented weird and wonderful and what they argued were impossible things. And the money was put up and the military interest was put up by General H.H. H. Arnold, who would end up going on to be the, uh, the first leader of the US, in, independent US Air Force much, much later on. Uh, but the Kettering Bug was this, this aerial torpedo, a drone. It was set on rails. It was powered by you know, a, a piston motor with a rotor and it had a Sperry gyroscope to keep it level. It was set as the crow flies towards the enemy. The rotor would turn a certain amount of revolutions. It would stop after a certain distance. It would pull in a chop from the wings, which would make the wings fall off. And then according to Arnold, it would swoop down on its prey like a, like a falcon or an eagle. Now, in reality, it would spin all over the place and it really didn't work very well and was never used in combat. But for me, what's interesting is that the allure of the drone is there, this ambition to separate the human from the danger of frontline battlefield fighting, to replace the vulnerable human body with a machine. And of course, this is something that we see as a virtuous allure of the drone today. So obviously, uh, in the first... Uh, era of aerial warfare, most of the the missions were manned, and uh, World War II didn't turn out to be uh, less costly in terms of competent lives than World War One. It was more so, and it was especially costly if you were flying strategic bombers. On the other hand, there was a, one very successful drone campaign, and that was the one that the Germans uh, waged with uh, with the. Uh, the V1, V2 rockets. Should we think of those as, as drones? I, I think so, most definitely. And the line today is increasingly blurred between what is a drone and what is a cruise missile. I think these right. systems were, you know, unmanned aerial vehicles um, that, were, that were set on a trajectory to hit a predetermined target beforehand. 
um, they were designed to you know make sure that you could inflict mass amounts of damage without of course um, the cost to, to Luftwaffe pilots as well so all of this tied in is, is definitely for me something which I would define as an early drone system and for Arnold it was as well you know there's this story when you dig through the archives of um, the US Army stumbling across V1s and V2s and wanting to get this technology and to harness it for their own branch of the military and then the Navy get the, the box that the US Army have put these V1s and V2s in and they put it in a bigger box because the Navy want this and then Arnold manages to get hold of these technologies and puts it even in a bigger box, stamps it with the uh, you know, US Army Air Service on the side and gets it sent back to the United States where they start developing these things. You know, Arnold develops the Rand Corporation, one of the world's first think tanks, in order to continue research into intercontinental missile technologies that will have pinpoint precision because he argues that in the nuclear context, it's more now than ever that we need to make sure that we have precision missiles so that things well don't get out of hand. And this is fascinating to me because in Cold War doctrine, it was all about missiles after a certain point. And uh, you can't really draw an obvious uh, distinction between a missile and, and, and a drone, except that a missile was designed to pack a really enormous punch in the case of a, an intercontinental ballistic missile, whereas drones seem to be characterized by their relative uh, smallness and, and pinpoint precision. So I was thinking about this uh, as, as you were giving your talk before in a marvelous irony, uh, I was cut off by a power cut. Isn't it great to be discussing technology and have the technology fail on you? But as, as, as we were talking and before I got cut off, my, my, my thought was, is the real difference between drones and missiles the evolving notion of, of the drone swarm as something that can operate in more complex ways than uh, missiles fired in a classic Cold War battle plan. I remember seeing an absolutely terrifying video, and I'm sure you've seen it too, demonstrating uh, the efficacy of, of the drone and the drone swarm as a, as a military uh, weapon the the culmination of the of the presentation is the the guy saying uh, with with a drone swarm you you can uh, attack a city and 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 just kill the bad guys because you use facial recognition as well as a, a, a weaponized drone so is that the real novelty that we're looking at here that that a swarm is just a lot more sophisticated than a hail of missiles I think that you know when it comes down to talking about swarms, um, there are, there, it's a contested term in many different ways, but I think you're right. When we take it down to the basics here and we look at the idea of you know, a multiple re-entry vehicles coming in to strike targets, the difference between the older Cold War technologies and coming through to the weapons we have today is that smartness that you talk about, this, this brain that's on board every miniature device. In fact, they're talking about hypersonic intercontinental ballistic missiles that will be sent across and then open up as they come in and we'll have a swarm of different drones that come out of it each with a preset target that will take out a military compound they'll take out you know an armored division they'll take out troops they'll take out each core point in a city almost in a weird way going back to that first world war idea of taking out with pinpoint precision uh, the war making capacity of an enemy now we can do that today but there's some real interesting debates going on at the moment I've been working a lot uh, in the archives on the work of Albert Wallstatter and his work on the delicate balance of terror and how you have to, to really make sure you are balancing this. And of course, he works a lot with the Kennedy administration, with McNamara, through counterforce and countervalue and MAD and all the disagreements that go on at this point. And one of the things that I'm learning from this history and these debates back then is you know, to what extent does the swarming pinpoint precision intercontinental ballistic missiles start to rock that delicate balance and rock the balance of deterrence as well. Because if you can guarantee the destruction of your enemy's nuclear arsenal, um, then you know, that doesn't make your enemy feel particularly safe in a world of, um, you know, um, where you've got security dilemmas and of course arms races as well. So do you start to see China and Russia respond in very different ways, ways which perhaps could be seen as offensive by us, 
because the United States and its allies have this capability to take out a nuclear arsenal very easily and, and very quickly. And interestingly, without raising above the nuclear threshold. One of the things that Wallstatter and um, Freddie Clay speak about in their 1988 work called uh, Discriminate Deterrence is how the United States needs to have a capability where it can have pinpoint um, conventional yield explosive weapons. Because if you can achieve precision, then you can achieve an increased impact on your enemy target. And if you have high yield conventional explosive, then you can take out an enemy nuclear target without having to go to the nuclear option. And so precision keeps you below that nuclear threshold, which is an interesting and slightly, I know, seemingly counterproductive um, idea that it could be destabilizing due to its effectiveness. I'm pretty sure, James, that some future historian will, will write a, a book with the title the, the Decline and Fall of Deterrence, because I think it's also clear that in cyber warfare and, and information warfare, there just isn't the deterrence that we came to accept as part of the, the nuclear age. Uh, let me wrap this interview with a final question. Uh, we, we historians are trying to make ourselves useful, uh, trying to help policymakers think about contemporary problems by putting them in historical perspective. Uh, what's the, the big takeaway? Uh, clearly, if, if, uh, if drone swarms of the sort that you're talking about launched by ICBMs could in fact destabilize the nuclear balance, uh, we might need to rethink our fundamental doctrines of, of national security and national defense. So give us a few thoughts about how this rethinking should happen and what, what the lessons of history are when it comes to adapting to a new technology like this, which has the potential to destabilize the balance of power itself. Well, you've, you've, you've almost answered my question for me there, Neil, because one of the things that I've learned from researching the last hundred years of this American ambition to achieve precision in war. First of all, it was the ambition to achieve a kinetic precision mixed in with this idea that it would be more moral and ethical and legal and more effective. And then it was more destructive, perhaps, or perhaps it could limit destruction. But every single time this ambition for precision has been put forward, it has largely failed in some way, shape or form. There is, I argue in my work, a precision myth. This idea that precision is a panacea to all the problems that come from war. But actually a kinetic precision is only one part of it. Right, you can pinpoint hit a target, but precision has ripples that come from it. Ripples in warfare, ripples in strategy, in society, many unforeseen consequences of those precision strikes. So even when we talk today about this idea of, right, okay, so the United States has the capability to take out this enemy's nuclear arsenal at will when it wishes to. Well, is there a guarantee of that? One of the problems with counterforce back in the Cold War was they never knew where all the silos were. So is precision as perfect and as sterile as it is made out? Well, the history shows that it definitely is not the case. And what are the consequences of that as we go forwards as well? Could it be far more destabilizing than the idea that precision solves everything? Um, for me, precision is a, a, a real kind of worrying road to go down when it justifies the use of force as an end in itself, because it, it really does cause a lot more problems than we foresee. Well, maybe the best illustration of that of that point is the extraordinary use the Obama administration made of drones in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, an often forgotten feature of President Obama's policy. That didn't exactly stabilize the region, did it? Absolutely. And not only that, you know, we have to remember that high tech is not an American monopoly. You don't keep hold of these technologies yourself forever. And we're starting to see now that 102 different nation states have military drones. Now that's not counting the non-state actors as well, that also have long range drones. You know, the Houthis are able to send drones, it's argued, over a thousand kilometers to strike sites like Aramco or to hit deep into Abu Dhabi, deep into Dubai. So this is no longer a technology that is just in the hands of state actors. Uh, state actors you might want to describe as rational. Instead, it falls into the hands of perhaps irrational terroristic actors who can strike into the cities of our allied nation states. Well, James, this has been a fantastic conversation and it's really whetted my appetite to read more of your work uh, and get more familiar with these new 
discontinuities in, in military technology. I know as we're having this conversation, it's uh, very nearly time for a pint in Copenhagen. So I will uh, let you go off and uh, enjoy that while we uh, on the other side of the world are barely past breakfast. Uh, thanks so much for your time, James, and, uh, and, and good luck with the, the future research and trying to persuade policymakers to pay heed to history. Thanks, Neil.